In this climate gen episode recorded from COP28 in Dubai at the midway point between the two weeks, I speak with Professor Kevin Anderson about how the COP has failed humanity, but actually is succeeding very well for the people running this colossal festival of carbon in the desert. We discuss unexpected voices arising here at COP28 from both the Global South and the Arctic Circle, calling for urgent research into geoengineering, what they call climate interventions. They claim the negotiations to eliminate carbon pollution has failed and it is their human right to have all options available to them. We also discuss how the IPCC has aligned itself with the heads of COP, which is essentially aligning itself with prolonged fossil fuel use way beyond the boundaries of safe climate. This is a very desperate time when even the urgency required to tackle the root cause is being ignored in favour of prolonging the fossil age. More interviews from COP28 will be published in the next week in full and made public. Thank you to all YouTube and Patreon members for supporting this series, which will be running all through 2024. Your support means this work can continue. A reminder that you can also pre-order my book Cop Out, How Governments Have Failed the People on Climate, from the link in the notes. Cop Out takes the reader deep into the blue zone to reveal what lies between the rhetoric of world leaders and the scientific realities we are being left to face. Thank you. Kevin, it's good to see you. I'm here at COP, you're wherever you are. I'm in Sweden at the moment, yeah, in a, in a quite cold Sweden. I'm in a hot, polluted Dubai. Phase out and phase down are irrelevant terms, really, if we expand production and keep using fossil fuels like we, we are and we seem to plan to be doing. The whole cop is sort of hooked on this cliffhanger, if you know. You've just co-authored an article in The Guardian with Simon Aldridge about low carbon hydrogen standards. And it seems like in sort of a new greenwash, dirty energy being touted in the UK. What is this and how safe is it? Well, it, it is the low carbon hydrogen strategy for the UK. But I think that's very misleading. Firstly, it's not low carbon and it's not really a strategy for the UK. What it is, is a business as usual strategy for the fossil fuel producers, for the oil and gas producers in the UK. So, it's a, it's a, that's the purpose of the strategy is to maintain a business as usual or as near as possible business as usual for the oil and gas producers in the UK, but also, of course, to maintain the business as usual for the policymakers. So, it's, it is very little to do with hydrogen, it's very little to do with low carbon, and it's, and it's certainly not a strategy for the UK. It's specifically aimed at particular groups, the, you know, the, the policymakers and the oil and gas companies. And so what they're doing there is, is hiding the fact they're going to just basically be, be using natural gas behind the, this language of hydrogen, because hydrogen is seen as this, in some abstract sense, hydrogen is seen as a low carbon energy source. And in some ways, it's quite attractive because it, you, you can burn it in similar ways to how you can burn conventional gas. So it maintains certain infrastructures the same. But the problem is that when you when you unpick it, what you find is that it has very high carbon emissions associated with it. And they are basically being hidden at, at, at every level. So at every level, from, from the fact that you've got to get the gas out of the ground, and that means you've got leaks of methane, which have a, a significant climate warming impact, particularly in the time frame we're focusing on for 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. You've got to move that methane around. You've then got to break that methane down to make the hydrogen. Hydrogen itself has a, has a, in the short term, has a global warming impact. It's an indirect global warming impact, but very similar to that of methane. So in other words, 30 times or so higher, really, than, than CO2 alone. So you've got both the methane and the hydrogen, any leaks from those, and it's a very complex system we're talking about, so there will be a lot of leaks, whatever you do, that those are going to severely impact the overall low-carbon low nature of this. And then also a lot of the assumptions about where we're going to put hydrogen in the UK is to put it into heating. Now, the idea we're going to burn this hydrogen, which, is, which has a very high carbon footprint anyway, and is incredibly energy inefficient, we're going to burn that rather than something like heat pumps. So you're talking about multiple levels of efficiency gain from having heat pumps relative to hydrogen. So no one but a fool or, or someone deeply corrupt would be really suggesting you should be using hydrogen for heating when there are very good alternatives already available. And interesting coming from Sweden, where Sweden made that switch across to mostly heat pumps a long time ago. So when you get in the UK, things like the Telegraph saying you can't have heat pumps. Well, I'm sorry, Sweden's been demonstrating heat pumps work for the last 20 or so years. 
So they clearly work in a cold country at scale. And yet in the UK, we're still talking about burning hydrogen in homes, which is incredibly inefficient. So at every level, society has been scammed by this scheme. And what it's not worse, but I suppose it's just only to be expected. This scheme, of course, is not going to be funded, as none of these schemes ever are, by the fossil fuel organisations. It's going to be funded by the British taxpayer. <laughs> so we've got these impoverished oil and gas companies that will be getting more money from the British taxpayer to allow them to produce another high carbon energy source from their oil and gas. There's, there is nothing in that that is positive. So after all of that, and you, you've you've highlighted i know there's a lot more detail in your article as well about the emissions and everything we're talking about public money which again we're always told there's no money for so many different things and yet there's uh, literally hundreds of millions here that's being handed out to these companies which it just seems like a transfer of wealth as to, opposed to anything that's truly valuable it's exactly that. I mean, it's, yeah it's a transfer of wealth on top of the windfall tax already I remember that windfall tax came about, you know, from the windfall benefits from, from Putin. It's not Russian war, in my view, it's a Putin war. From Putin's war, um, you know, that the, the, the oil and gas companies did remarkably well out of that. But they did remarkably well because the policymakers across different governments had fundamentally failed to deliver on their Paris Agreement, well, on their climate change agreements going right back to 1992. If we had, had, if we had actually delivered on a lot of the commitments that those policymakers made, that I took as good faith, um, but in good faith, but clearly they weren't being honest, then we would we would have actually not been as reliant on fossil fuels. We would have built a really rich renewable energy scheme, energy system behind this, or low carbon energy system, but we hadn't. And so, you know, the, so the oil and gas companies made a huge amount of money, the windfall profits that they made, but they made that out of the back of weak governments that have been repeatedly lobbied by oil and gas companies not to go down the renewable or low carbon energy route. And so then when Putin invaded, the price of oil and gas goes up and for doing no additional work, Shell, BP and these companies made even more money. And now they're looking to make even more money from the taxpayer via this low carbon hydrogen scam. Maybe that's a better acronym for it. It is a scam. So point by point over the last well, almost since we first had the first agreement on climate change back in 1992, certainly for two decades, the oil companies have deeply controlled how the policymakers have framed energy in somewhere like the UK, and I would argue probably, probably almost every country in the world. And this is just the latest ruse for making sure that the oil and gas executives make a lot of money out of, out of the public. Yeah. Considering that connection between oil and gas executives and lobbyists and government officials, even the prime minister's family seem to be investing in these projects. And then you come to somewhere like the COP, where it speaks for itself, the presidency and everything like that. The UK thing you've just talked about is another piece of this jigsaw of this whole COP process where we talk about equity and innovation all the time. But in truth, any benefit is only for those who already are comfortable, who already are in the driving seat. How do you, and well, firstly, do you think that's that's true in, in a sense that what we see in the UK is a microcosm of what's going on everywhere else. And it's really just the same people mm. benefiting. You come here and they, they disagree about the final outcome, choose not to do anything. And we kick the ball down to next year. I don't see the sort of senior people, if you like, and I'm being ca quite careful to use the, not to use the word elite too much now, because I think it gets misunderstood, because I, I do mean elite in a slightly pejorative sense. But what, you know, the people who like to see themselves as elites, the senior people at places like COP and our government officials, the CEOs, the oil companies, these are not representatives of our country. They, they are much more closely linked to each other than they are to their nations. So the nations are just a secondary place. These are effectively... I suppose, international citizens. There was a particular group of them, and these are the ones who've done remarkably well. I mean, it, I don't just mean you know, well-paid professors here. I mean, a, a group of people that are just is a, in a stratospherically different place from their income and power and wealth and resources. And they are simply unprepared. I mean, they're fully aware that, that the position they're in is bizarre, and probably they were fully aware it's obscene as well. But they are they will do everything that they can to avoid that being questioned and to make sure that they get their on new ongoing revenue streams 
from the public because ultimately they are held in that position. Society's resources are massively skewed to that particular group and they want to maintain that. And one of the tricks to do that, first, is to delude yourself that you're worth it. But I think the level of what they have, it, it, you know, they're, they're not so stupid as about to delude themselves. They're fully aware it, it is, it is um, it's a totally unreasonable the position they're in, but they enjoy being in that position. And the second trick is to convince everyone else that we need them. And they've been phenomenally successful with that. So they, they're, they're, they've um, narrated a story of envy that, that says, oh, it's just that other people want, you know, want their wealth. You know, well, people don't want it individually. We'd just rather it be spent on the health service, on an energy system for everyone, or good quality schooling. You know, the, all the things that in somewhere like the UK, you see an infrastructure that's literally collapsing and fragmenting, breaking down physically, whether that's the quality of the buildings of our schools, whether it's how many uh, pupils there are per class, whether it's the, this appalling state of our roads, of our rail networks, you know, every single you know, facet of a highly industrialized society is breaking down whilst this small elite co cohort at the top are taking these huge resources. That is country by country by country. So I think we have to sort of step back and think, you know, Sunak, Kerry, the chair of the COP, these aren't people from different countries. They're all from the same country. And that country is a country called obscene wealth. And I don't just mean slightly better off than the average. You know, as we, as we see from the carbon emissions, and we see from all the data from the Financial Times, I mean, not a left-wing magazine, the data in the Financial Times shows this, but from the carbon emissions alone, the top 1% of carbon footprints that are greater collectively than the bottom half of the world's population. I mean, it's just sort of, a, it, it, they're mind, mind-boggling numbers that are now completely normalized in our society. And these are the guys we see all lined up here, um, basically declaring they're gonna save us all. I was in a session this morning and there were four youths from Global South countries and they said, look, basically you've been having this carbon conversation now for a long time and you've failed. And they were, well, they were members of Younger and various other groups, but they were saying, we want research into climate interventions. And I was quite taken back by this because normally it's the opposite. They say, we don't want climate interventions. We want um, reduced carbon. The one guy from Honduras said, the lack of work on adaptation, the, the delay that it took to get work going, and they were being struck by hurricanes, it set them back in a, by 20 years in terms mm -hmm. of development. He said, now we're, we're talking about interventions because the climate conversation has failed. But what is it going to take to scale up research, not deployment, research into interventions so that we don't make the same mistake we did with adaptation? Because we're all worried, firstly, that our communities are just not going to be there. Secondly, young people are getting very disenfranchised because um, they see it as the global north always telling them, no, you can't have research into this. They're not represented very well at all. So what Honduras is not represented in the IPCC at all with any experts. The young guy from Ghana said they had one person on the IPCC and that person was like a hero in Ghana, like a role model for young people going into education. And all these things, it was such a fascinating conversation because they were so determined to become part of the conversation and to, to start trying to get involved in the process. And it was it was actually the most interesting thing I've seen, or I can recall seeing at one of these conferences, because it was so heartfelt. What would your response to them in terms of what we've done with carbon, where we failed with adaptation, and what we're doing now with looking at interventions? Right, let me just be clear. When you say interventions, are you effectively talking about geoengineering? Explicitly talking about geoengineering, yeah, in terms of cloud yeah, brightening. Okay. So, yeah, okay. Well, that's interesting because I just had a, a morning discussion about geoengineering here. Well, firstly, I, the, the first part of that, I don't think, remember the people negotiating, the senior people there haven't failed, they've succeeded. Let's, let's remind ourselves that they have been phenomenally successful since 1992 in ensuring we do almost nothing about climate change. And their success is demonstrated by, we even discuss it as if it's a failure. 
it's clearly a success. They had no intention of doing anything about climate change. And we have now emitted more carbon dioxide. We've burned more fossil fuel since 1990 than we burned in all of human history before then. So if you're looking for any mark of success, that should surely be it. So I don't think straight away we should assume that because we've failed, we have to move on to something else because we haven't failed. That group have been successful. And that does mean we have to think about, well, what would success to the rest of us who think climate change is a serious issue? Remember, these people don't think climate change is a serious issue. It's just a serious threat to their, to their business as usual and their norms and their way of living. But to the rest of us who think it's genuinely a threat, then we have to think, are there ways to overturn that existing failure? With failure in our terms, success in theirs. And I think that opens up a new, a new, new way to consider these issues. Do not consider the senior people at COP are on the same side as the rest of us. They are not. They are locked into a particular mindset. And in that, I mean the great and goods that are there as well. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm tempted to name them, but <laughs> you can make a guess as to who, who a lot of these are. Um, on adaptation, yeah, my understanding is, it's not my area at all, but my understanding is, is that just peanuts have been spent trying to understand adaptation. And adaptation isn't just about building bits of kit. It's also, you know, it's very cultural, it's very social. But I mean, that still takes an understanding of the research to, to find out what, what cultural structures, what norms are very useful in one place that you might be able to apply somewhere else. So there's a lot of, I mean, there's still a lot to be done because because adaptation, more than mitigation, adaptation is much more geographically specific. It depends on your geography, your culture, your socioeconomic norms. There's a whole set of things, your population density, all sorts of things play out in terms of adaptation that are quite different. They're quite distinct and have to be highly customized, if you like. And which in some respects makes them more challenging. But clearly we've failed and we've spent pennies on that. We've spent very little on mitigation either, to be honest. And so having almost spent very little on mitigation, and really we just, we just followed the rhetorical nonsense of the great and good for 30 years, spent very little on adaptation. I'm sort of reluctant to say, well, the next step there is we have to move to geoengineering. I mean, I do think that, that, that we should be saying, why have we failed on mitigation? Why are we why are we failing on mitigation, rather? Why are we still failing on adaptation? I don't think those in themselves give us a good enough reason to say, well, let's put our eggs in the uh, geoengineering basket. That's not to say that we shouldn't be doing some geoengineering research. There are three things here. Well, certainly one thing to start off with. Geoengineering does not solve the problem. Geoengineering, in, in my view, is effectively a sticking plaster on gangrene. So you've got this nasty disease that is eating away at your body. And every time it gets a bit bigger, you put a bigger plaster over it. You can't see it. Then it comes out the sides. It gets a bit bigger. And so, so it doesn't solve the problem. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't try and pursue it. There are still merits sometimes for doing that. So the two real risks with geoengineering is one, that it delays action. It delays mitigation. And we've seen that with negative emission technologies, which actually try to solve the problem, at least, I mean, theoretically. At least that way you're trying to remove carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So at least theoretically, it's trying to solve the problem. Geoengineering isn't. And what geoengineering and, in fact, negative emission technologies have done is they've literally delayed real mitigation action. So that's a serious risk. But the more positive end of that is it delays impacts. So geoengineering at its best can delay impacts of climate change. And so there may well be appropriate places for that. For me personally, I think that they again need to be quite specific. I'm not in favor of the grand schemes for geoengineering our planet in any way. I just think that we, that degree of, of arrogance is what's got us into these sorts of problems. We are incredibly good at, as a species so far, post-enlightenment, we've been incredibly good at reductionist thinking, of breaking things down into silos. But we have so far demonstrated a complete inability to, to look at system-level challenges, other than we can now recognise we face system-level challenges. But we're still trying to use a sort of 19th and 20th century reductionist mindset to solve system-level challenges. And that's what geoengineering is, particularly at a global level. That said, if you can think about more sort of specific local approaches that may have some merit and that that minimize the other of the other knock-on implications so if you're looking at say roofing tiles on houses 
But why have those dark in a place that's suffering from lots of heat in the summer? Why not? Can we change the color of those? Now, that's geoengineering. You're not solving the problem of climate change, but you're addressing some of the issues, some of the symptoms of climate change. Why are all our roads dark? Could we look at changing certain species of, of, um, of crops so they might have a lighter leaf? Now, the problem with that, of course, is it might affect vitamin A uptake in the plant, which might mean it affects everyone's diet. And so you've got to look at these system implications. But I would much rather us look at these sort of smaller, more controllable forms of geoengineering than these grand schemes like let's fire rockets into the stratosphere and spread out sulfates into a part of the atmosphere we don't fully understand either thermodynamically or dynamically at all. And so there's, you know, these are these sort of Dr. Strange love approaches, I think, are incredibly dangerous. But that's not to say we may think of other options that we can try and, and, and test. So, yes, I think we should do some research on it. But the problem is when we do research on geoengineering, because we have unscrupulous policy leaders, basically all the senior people in COP, because of those people, even the discussion of geoengineering will be used as, an ex and as another excuse, and that will filter through into the IPCC as well, as it has done with negative emission technologies and the, the outputs from the IPCC. It will filter through to the IPCC that allow us to delay mitigation today, to delay action today, so that we can get things like, the, in my view, the ridiculous statement that comes out from the chair of the IPCC in defense of the chair of the COP, that 1.5 degrees centigrade still has lots of fossil fuels in 2050. 1.5 degrees centigrade still has about 45% of current gas, I think, and a 60% reduction in oil, something like that, but still lots of, no more coal, but lots more fossil fuels in 2050. That simply does not fit with the maths. And that's because the, the chair of the IPCC has been completely, I'm about to say hoodwinked, but he's fully aware of this, so it's not hoodwinked, but has been completely taken in by the, the rhetoric of negative emission technologies. The rhetoric of geoengineering will have the same levels of danger. And we have to guard against that because it's not that these are real things. We talk about them and by talking about them and giving them a label, we make them appear material like they really exist like negative emission technologies really exist. They don't. There are a few pilot schemes. There's nothing out there in any sorts of scale relative to what we want so far. We, we capture about 0.02% of all fossil fuel CO2 emissions, 0.02% of all, uh, so nothing basically. And so I just think the, the, the temptation of saying we've failed at mitigation, we've failed at adaptation, therefore we need geoengineering. I think that's a very dangerous route to go down. By the way, if you do want to see some of these carbon capture fantasies, I can point you towards the Saudi Arabian Green Innovation Building, which looks like they've spent millions yeah. on. I, I watched Dr. Strange Love years ago, and that was about that um, particular pavilion. Quite incredible. You've identified the top level coppers who are basically part of the status quo. And there's this big equity issue. There is things around innovation that we need to do and investment and reducing our own impact in the global north. And there's also a lot of cynicism, and rightly so, about this whole event. Seeing some of these people speaking, and they're young, they're extremely knowledgeable, they're extremely well-versed in what they're talking about. They know all the figures. They really understand life from their perspective. But it, it's very impressive to see and they're, they're getting a lot out of this conference and i'm just trying to ask the question is there a comp something emerging where we need to take these good bits and grow them? and in some ways the things they're talking about equity is is how it's perceived back in their homes where having one person on the ipcc inspires their youths to take up the physics of the, you know, these kinds of things that otherwise wouldn't happen and if they do decide to expand their participation or be given more license or whatever and they do decide they want to pursue things that we in the global north might not be so keen on as a, as a collective where do we stand with allowing these emergent things about interventions, adaptation, you know, different approaches, and voices? 
I mean, I have sort of views on this, but I also am aware that as a wealthy white colonial, we have to be careful saying how others sh should approach these sorts of things. Well, I'm um, trying to ask more about feel... how do we feel, because at the moment we're fully in the driving seat and, and they're selling it because they, don't, they have no representation except themselves coming here and speaking loud. If, mm. if we could reduce the cynicism by putting the negotiations which seem to be recorded in a loop over there, and then it, expanding these side conversations, which are all about, they're much more dynamic and they really are unlocking hmm. research funding, and making connections. Yeah, no, that, there's a lot to be said for all that. And I mean, I witnessed that in Glasgow, you know, away from the nonsense of the blue zone, which is as usual pointless. And when it wasn't pointless, it was maintaining the status quo. Um, maybe that's what we should call it, the business as usual zone. Um, but away from that, you know, the outside the gated area, then there were lots of really interesting dynamic discussions being had. But I am also cautious that one of the real tricks of the status quo is to periodically open up its doors and let others in. And that's how you maintain it, to give the impression of openness, of diamondism. You know, so someone from Ghana gets in the IPCC, but if the IPCC chair starts saying it's perfectly okay to be burning lots of oil and gas in 2050, which basically is what he said, um, then I think that is incredibly dangerous. So is the IPCC the right place? So this is why I'm cautious, you know, some sort of about me speaking about these issues. Is it appropriate for people from outside the global north and the normal voices, if you like, that success for them is to be included within formal structures that have been set up by us, the IPCC, the COP process? Or is it better that they find something else of their own that we get might that we might be invited along to? That we is it better that we allow a few of them in to join us in our party? I can see a temptation for that, and I can see how it can be incredibly appealing to people when they when they get invited in. But I'm not sure that's what we need. I, I, I think 2023, we've got, I mean, for 1.5 degrees centigrade, we've got five to seven years of current budget left at current emissions, at, at current emissions. If you bring them down, it's a bit longer. We've got 15 to 18 years for two degrees centigrade. We've got that report out um, from Rocks and others just talking about the the scale of the um, additional impacts above 1.5 degrees centigrade. You know, nothing points in, the, in a positive direction. Nothing. We need to shake this thing up. We don't just need to rock it a little bit, maybe just rip it apart. I don't know where we go from here. I'm, I've got to a point this year where all I can really say is that the structures we have have fundamentally failed. And there is every sign that they will carry on fundamentally failing. And in that, I also mean the IPCC, the academic community. You know, we have stayed so quiet. We have supported the status quo by our silence. That's not saying everyone's been like that, but a huge number of people are. Some of the formal NGOs, they've also been far too pliant. So have our media. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a cry of, to me, and I'm sad to have to say this, but it's a cry of despair. And I'm not sure looking to people like me and others to say, we know what we should do. I, I, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I know what key criteria need to be there and they they seem flippant and trite. They're, you know, honesty, integrity, courage, humility, those sorts of things are what we need at people at COP. You know, not, not a, a mixture of elite people arriving up there and then, and then surrounded by a load of sycophants and brown noses. That is just not helpful. We've done that for 30 years. It's failed. And it's percolated through the system. So it's not as if it's just that, that top little cadre of oil barons that, uh, and other associated acolytes that are there. It's percolated right the way down to the IPCC, to the integrated assessment models, to the way that we fund our research. You know, a government clicks its fingers, we want net zero 2050, or we want a reduction of 80% by 2050. And the research councils jump up in the air and say, that's what all our universities will do now. <laughs> yeah. you know, where, where's the independent questioning of these things? No, it's not there. And so the research looks to be independent, but the research works in deeply subjective boundaries. We've known that and we've carried on with it. We're party to that. So it is a it is almost a cry of despair. I don't know where we need to go, and I'm I'm less 
enthusiastic, I suppose, about just saying, let's open up the doors to other people from elsewhere. I think maybe they need to come crashing through the doors and kick out the incumbents, which means people like me and, and others. You know, I, I, I don't know where we go with this. I mean, the, the only hope, hopeful sign and it all sounds strange to some people, I've said it for a while now, is that civil, quite a lot of civil society groups, what they're calling for is much more in line with what the science suggests. And I wonder if it's because, well, firstly, the science, most academics are incredibly sort of thin-skinned individuals that we're, we're not, you know, we are, we are, we're easily afraid of funding, of losing our jobs, of standing up, putting our heads above the parapet. There have been exceptions to this, and in fact, the climate science community, in opposing a lot of the, the um, pressures from the oil companies, they deserve significant credit for standing up to, the, to those. But on, on, on actually reducing emissions, and we have failed. We've been, I mean, to be truly honest, we've been pretty pathetic in this. Uh, and so, I. I say I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit lost as to where we go. Civil society has somehow managed to align its calls with our science. And I wonder if as scientists, we, and as academics, as, ex, as sort of post-enlightenment academics, the problem is that we view the, the, view the world through a very narrow lens. We're very good at silo reductionist thinking. And that has been phenomenally successful. And it's been successful you know, for the last almost 200 years. But the challenges we face now, not just climate change, climate change is just one symptom, one ecological system, symptom, and also a whole lot of social symptoms of the structures of, of modern society. But I see nothing at the moment that suggests we have any system level skills in our, in our universities to address those challenges. We, are, we have divided ourselves into departments, into silos, into areas of expertise that are incredibly narrow and phenomenally successful. But we haven't developed a way of thinking about the whole and strangely enough, civil society, maybe in fact, this is the general public, are much better at thinking like that than we as academics and experts are. Do you think it so comes... I suppose I'm sort of taking everything now and throwing it in the air and saying, I don't know how it's going to land. <laughs> really, you know, we, we can't have another COP like this next year or like last year's COP. And Glasgow COP was no different. You know, th this, is, this is an irrelevance. Climate to the senior people there, climate change is not a serious issue. It's just an annoyance that every year for two weeks, they've got pretends to care about climate change. They get their, they get their acolytes to polish their speeches. They'll all fly there in their private jets. They'll spout some utter nonsense. Then they'll disappear back to their countries to live their incredibly energy profligate lives, supported by a, a supine media um, run by a handful of incredibly wealthy media barons. And, and the narrative continues for another year and another year. As failure is inevitable, I mean, even the Saudi energy minister said he won't even entertain phase down, and then phase out. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, the farce is thick, you know, it's, it's really coated. We're going to come out of this. And cynicism the, in the, it's the UK alone is, is quite incredible. I suppose the question is, what do we do going forward? Because we are now conscious of this on a daily basis, even if we're not yeah. experiencing it like the people on the front lines. Well, we're, we're not experiencing it directly. We, we, was, we are, we, I mean, uh, I, I do think we have, to, I mean, I'm in Sweden and there was an energy crisis here after Putin's invasion. You know, that energy crisis need not have occurred if we'd made the move away from fossil fuels. So even in the wealthy countries, in somewhere like the UK, where I mean, 10 to 20 percent of houses were plunged into, well, nearer 20 percent, I think, were plunged into fuel poverty in, a, in the what, sixth or seventh richest country in the world because some idiot chooses to invade a country next door. We were in that position because we were being run by bloody idiots in the UK for so long that they hadn't responded to the challenge. They just, as Dee Smogger pointed out, I mean, they just had the oil executives through the revolving door backwards and forwards, the ministers on a sort of hourly basis. And they're really very incredibly weak ministers that we've had. Not there's a lot of good policymakers. The incredibly weak ministers hadn't responded to the climate agenda. So people in the global north, uh, many the average people in the global north have also suffered the repercussions of not addressing climate change on many levels. So so it's not as if it's just a problem of the global south. It's much worse than the global south and some of the more climate vulnerable communities whose whose lives have been lost, whose and societies have been fragmented and increasingly you know, military tensions and so forth. But also that some of these things are slowly starting to play out in the global north, particularly the poorer, the average people in the global north.
So let's not pretend that it isn't. You know, this is a global challenge, and it's going to, it's going to get worse and worse until we you know, are, are prepared to kick out, kick out the incumbents. You know, that most of them are not going to change. On that note, I think it's a very good place to to end. That genuinely sums it up. So thank you very much. I'll try and be more upbeat next year. <laughs>